Welcome to another edition of Complete Sports Media's podcast. I'm your host, Darren Campbell. And we're going to be talking hockey today. My guest today is a really special guest. Uh, his name is Brandon Wong. Brandon's been involved in the game of hockey for over 25 years. Started playing uh, locally here in BC, ended up into the BC Hockey League, uh, ended up uh, finally going and getting a four-year scholarship down south, and then became a professional and played nine pro seasons, over 400 professional games in eight different countries around the world. Decided to come back to BC, make this his home, start a really great hockey school and camp. Yeah, he's able to join me today. Thanks so much for your time today, Brandon. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on there, Darren. This is going to be great. Uh, really excited. I was looking forward to this all weekend and knowing that we'd have an opportunity to talk about your life in hockey. Uh, we might as well start at the beginning. So tell me about growing up in Victoria, getting involved in the game of hockey. Uh, I, I, I guess your parents were quite supportive and uh, really pushed you uh, into, this, into the sport. Yeah, it's, um, I was born in Vancouver, uh, moved, moved to Victoria when I was four and basically raised in Victoria um, uh, from an early age. I was into sports. Both my parents were into sports um, and just supported to always uh, be active and, and learn through sports is what uh, their philosophy was. And back then for me, it was just play, play, play. And just, I think the competitiveness and keeping busy keeping my mind busy and uh yeah just enjoying all that stuff and um I think when I was well I definitely played a lot of road hockey with my my dad and uh all his friends and then that uh, led into some ice hockey I think when I started about six years old maybe five and a half or so but uh at the Victoria Racquet Club uh, in Novice and played there my whole uh, minor hockey, I guess you call it my hockey career and uh, all the way up to Bantam. Um, yeah, my parents always supported me and and even my, my sister and brother. Uh, my brother also played at the Racquet Club. My sister played, uh, she played a lot of uh, girls hockey. Great. Um, yeah. And she got a scholarship as well to Red Deer College. My brother got a scholarship to for lacrosse, Bellarmine, Kentucky. But um, yeah, they always just put their time and and their, I guess, their investments into um, sports. And uh, hockey was, was the true love for me. And um, yeah, that's just, I guess, what I wanted to do and who I was, so did that. And then, um, yeah, it just became, I guess, a little more serious and more commitment that I played, got into the junior hockey and received a full ride scholarship to uh, Quinnipiac University. And then um, that also there led to playing nine years professionally. And, and here I am today. Yeah, well, that's a, an amazing story. It's uh, so nice to be able to get a passion at a young age and uh, make it your career, make it a way to find, you know, to make you money. Uh, they say that is the definition of happiness. If you can find what you're passionate about, uh, find out a, a way to make it make you money, it doesn't feel like work. Uh, did it ever feel like work in this whole journey? Yeah, it has. Uh, it's had its ups and downs for sure. Um, to some, sometimes, I guess, my perspective is just what people are willing to do um, towards what they have interest or have that passion towards. So. Um, yeah, no, I definitely certainly love sports and, and love hockey and um, was willing to do different things and just keep pushing through the, the tough times, I guess, and had uh, people, family and friends able to even, I guess, coaches and stuff and teammates to be able to talk to while not having uh, the good times. But uh, I think we all go through all that stuff through life and through sports or whatever else and um yeah it was just it's a long uh it's a long journey for sure but it just kind of busies you for that long and um you meet so many great people and friends uh during that time and and uh yeah there's just many different memories 
On your website, I see that there's uh, 21 hockey organizations listed there as teams that you've uh, played for and uh, represented. Uh, I know you went to um, Canucks uh, rookie camp uh, back in the day. Uh, tell me about that experience of uh, being a BC boy and able to go and uh, put the Canucks jersey on and, uh, and, and play in that, that rookie camp. That must have been a, a big thrill. Yeah, it was, it was pretty neat, especially looking back, of course, uh, at the time. It was like, well, this is where I'd love to play and determined to, to make a uh, well, difference or, or to, to get someone's attention, of course. Um, after my second year of uh, NCAA college, when I was about 21, I think, got invited to that camp. Um, yeah, I remember receiving calls from a number of of the different Canuck staff uh, inviting to the camp. And um, yeah, it was, I guess at the time it was like very, is a proud and very cool moment that uh, had been invited to my uh, favorite team and my, um, all the, I guess, players and teams that I looked up to, especially being locally here. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just, went there for camp for the week long camp and uh, the big names there, I guess these days was uh, Corey Snyder and uh, Michael Grabner. Uh, I think the first round draft pick that year was Patrick White during that time. And um, I actually had some buddies there that were there with me. Um, Taylor Ellington, Jordy Ben, uh, Dan Gender, and also a guy that I played with was Jeff, Jeff Conrad. So we all, sort of knew each other during that time, um, which is pretty neat. Um, yeah. yeah that, and, must have been wow. that must have been yeah. so neat to be surrounded with players that were uh, high draft picks and, and, you know, moving up into the, the pro ranks, obviously, and then, uh, you know, buddies that you grew up with. Um, Victoria uh, actually is quite the hockey hotbed, and you mentioned uh, Jordy Ben. The Ben brothers, uh, you know, are two of the – you know, real big names to come out of there. Obviously, the Courtney brothers years ago. Why do you think so many great players uh, came out of Victoria? What What was it about Victoria that was able to produce a lot of great players? Um, that's a good question. I would say that you know, it's it's a very the island's very small, and especially the hockey community. Everyone knows everyone. Um, at the same time, I think out this way is you kind of away from all the other distractions in the big cities and stuff. Uh, you can hone your skills and um, I guess for the most part, there's, you can train whenever you want kind of thing. Um, truly believe with less distractions, there's more time towards any type of training, even just as, as these days I'd like to relate it to these days, there's so many distractions for kids with the technology and the iPads and iPhones that they don't get out on the, on the road as much and play road hockey. I feel like in our generation, there was um, a lot more road hockey being played and that was just skills training without even knowing it. Um, and even in our parents' generation, uh, it sounded like they played even more road hockey, just not much else to do other than that stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I yeah. I just think uh, there's, there are some people committed uh, in this um, on the Island here to, to, make playing in the NHL one day and they, they love hockey and just try and commit. You mentioned the racket club. Yeah. Obviously a lot of great players uh, played there all the time and it was a, a really great breeding ground. Then you joined the Cougars. Uh, that must've been quite the thrill to be uh, in the, and then in that league in your hometown, uh, starting to get into the, the junior ranks. Uh, tell me about uh, how that occurred. Um, how you, you joined that team. Yeah. Um, that was probably the big kickstart of my whole hockey um, career, I guess, like the advanced part. Um, I always loved hockey through minor, minor hockey at the Rock Club and just was committed, always showed up just because I loved it anyways and felt like I was behind, wanted to get better. Um, and yeah, I was always like a good player, but I was never the best. So I was always chasing someone and, and just being... Um, uh, around guys that were pretty good and playing against guys that are very good, obviously like some Vancouver players. Uh, I know a lot of the Burnaby winter club guys were very good. And um, 
North Shore Winter Club had uh, Gilbert Boulet at the time and a couple others, but yeah, I went to Surrey camp when I was 15 and did extremely well at rookie camp. I believe I was getting like five points a game, which was like a huge surprise to me. Um, basically playing against players like my age though, I think, and maybe a year, maybe two years older. Um, I just remember it and, uh, and definitely it was definitely obviously keeping little stats of how I was doing because I wanted to make it so badly. But um, there from Syria was the last cut and um, it worked, turned out to be pretty good that, um, so, yeah, it was like the last, if not the second to last cut, I believe it was the last. And then went back to the Victoria Cougars who Craig Dinman uh, was the head coach of and Craig now is a uh, current Victoria Grizzlies coach. Um, in the BCHL and he's been around for a long time um, but Craig just provided uh, a great opportunity for me I remember starting on the third line with two workers and really tough guys um, as to kind of how he was almost like from that line it was like we were uh, in today's generation where um, you know they play four lines and you, you got a a young guy that's, I guess you'd say on the softer side, uh, not as aggressive. And you got two really tough guys at work and, and we all just uh, seemed to play really well together. But I found myself about quarter into the year on the, the top line with uh, um, one of the, well, the captain and a mentor on the team, Mark Van Helbert and another uh, player, Jeff Irwin, who made it pretty far as well to the East coast uh, hockey league and uh and Sibley and Mankato but we did really well we all finished one two three in scoring um in the league in the league yeah, in the league I was the third yeah yeah wow. and uh I got rookie of the year so that's what kind of jumped everything up and then that following year that's when I hopped in with the Surrey Eagles and uh the head coach from the previous year that had cut me Mark Hollick he had um I think he had moved moved on somewhere else I'm not sure where and the assistant coach Ryan Thorpe uh became the head coach and he was the assistant coach that year that was cut so he had remembered me and um pretty crazy how it all happened but he had had uh, followed me during the year because he had messaged me during the year and yeah he's um signed myself and uh the two other young rookies that were there one was Andrew Kozak who was a top scorer of the KIJHL and uh also, Tyson Angus was with the KIJHL as well, um, and he was one of my best friends. And um, yeah, that all worked out. Played on a great Surrey Eagles team that first year. Played not very much at all. Um, so I remember sitting on the bench a lot, probably even the most in my whole hockey career. Um, and But Surrey was a great organization at the time. They were wanting to win. Uh, we ended up losing that year, second round, but the following year played one month in, did really well, but was traded to Powell River. Uh, Surrey had won the championship that year, but uh, it provided, Powell River provided a really great opportunity um, with Terry Perkins um, and um, Darren Rodney as the coaches. And uh, yeah, I did extremely well. I was able to carry... Um, I'd say, I mean, definitely there's other great players and, and there's a handful of us that we could carry the team, but provided the opportunity, I, I was able to step up and that's what kind of um, got a lot of attention. And and from there, I was traded to Merritt after the season. Um, and that's another another big move in the stepping stone to, to I guess, going after my dreams. And Why did you up. have so much success in Merritt? Uh, the, the statistics uh, just blow me away. Six, 60 games, 50 goals, 66 assists. Far and away, uh, the top scorer on your team. Uh, you must have been one of the league leaders that year. Uh, what was it about Merritt that uh, shot you up uh, up the ranks and had, you know you were able to produce so much there? Yeah, I just think uh, looking back, you know, never was the best. So it was always... Uh... I guess you'd say the guy climbing his way up in the underdog and mentally I just went, had that, you know, that switch that I was able to stay zoned in on what I actually wanted. And I knew I had to reform to get that scholarship. Um, even, even in Powell River, I had been offered um, 
a full ride for for the year after that I played in Merritt or the year uh, following year after that. And I took too long to take, so they had moved on. Um, and from there, I didn't have a scholarship. Yeah, yeah it was a wow. diff- interesting situation. Did that, sort of, did, that, did that sort of worry you that uh, they had moved on? Um, yeah, a little bit, for sure. I'd like, oh, what did I just do kind of thing? I mean, there was a full ride on the table and they wanted me for either year. So that's, that's basically telling me they wanted me. Um, and it took too long, probably a good two, three weeks, I think it was. And they had moved on middle of the season. So it is what it was. And it worked. I mean, it works out for kind of, I guess, how it was supposed to work out and for the best. But um, going to that merit year, I just trained so hard by myself uh, in the gym and dry land. and. That's just how I was able to get on top. But I just remember every everything I, I shot went in the net. And um, I played with great players. So uh, one guy, Brandon Campos, was on my line. Mikey Wanchuk, who's a hardworking guy, who's our captain. Um, who else? We had a couple other really strong players. Wade McLeod joined our team late, and he's a good player. Uh, we had a guy, Casey Z- Piero Zavatel, who was extremely good at – came along uh, a long way three quarters into the season um and we had a very strong team we did we we did well that regular season and just seemed to play with the right players and seemed to have everything go in the net and get lucky that way but um that whole year just kind of uh worked out really yeah. well had yeah great well <clears throat> wow did it ever um yeah super impressive and obviously uh, you ended up getting a scholarship out of that I, you mentioned some of those players, Brandon Campos. Uh, he played 46 games, uh, 27 goals, 53 assists for 80 points. Uh, super impressive. Uh, Mike Ewanchuk, he had 237 penalty minutes that year. Uh, he, he, he must have been uh, able to get you guys the, the space you needed. Uh, was that why uh, he was the captain and on that team? Uh, just yeah. unbelievable. For sure. He was, uh, he was a leader. He was willing to do anything for the team, um, team guy, and always had the work ethic, I remember. Um, definitely not our top skill guy, but just, um, yeah, he just provided that energy all the time. And, uh, yeah, we switched lines around quite a bit, but wasn't always with, uh, with Mike. But, um, yeah, just remember um, the, most of the team that you're having a um, – um, a big impact. I know even too, we had uh, Alan Mazer and Jared Tootin as well that were big parts. Um, and then we had tried, we went for it at the end by making like a six player trade and um, we acquired Brad Thiessen who played in the AHL. I'm not sure if he played any NHL games, but I think he backed up. Um, yeah, he was our we traded for him and we tried to go for it, but Penticton was, was too good. They, they beat us in the second round and um, I think they went to lose, went on to lose in the finals, I think that year. Penticton uh, still strong uh, winning uh, the division year after year after year. And, and one of the, the top teams uh, winning a lot of cups and yeah, fantastic success. Uh, must've been tough for so many teams to try to compete with them. They always seem to get uh, so much top end talent. I, I looked down a, a lot of the uh, guys on that um, on that roster. Uh, there was, I think, six guys that uh, had over 100 penalty minutes. So very physical team, uh, a lot of skill. Casey Piero Zabatel, uh, he ended up coming over here and playing with the Giants. I remember him uh, with the Giants. And um, yeah, what? Uh, where did he end up going? Uh, what? Where did his career end up taking him? Uh, I think Zabby, he ended up. Um... Well, he was talking to her, had committed to Michigan Tech, but then he made that move to the Vancouver Giants, did extremely well. I think he led the WHL in scoring. Um, he just got better and better year by year, a uh, young guy from, our, from when I was playing with him. But he ended up, I think, getting drafted by Pittsburgh Penguins, I think, and um, has been playing in the, we'll say, the minors for a long time. Um, I'm not sure what he's probably even going on his 13th pro year maybe amazing um, amazing yeah it's impressive east coast and i think he tried overseas but i think he's won a couple uh echl championships i think one being right. with Allen and the other with colorado tell me about your coach uh, al glenn denning there in merit 
how meaningful was he for you, uh, pushing your career forward, obviously giving you that ice time, enabling you to, you know, uh, score that that many goals, 50 goals in 60 games. That's a you know impressive number. Yeah, I always uh, right from the beginning. He, I just remember going in there, and and to be honest, I was just like a young hockey player and just an immature kid, just not really knowing uh, too much, and just all I wanted to do was play hockey and do well. Um, but they they had treated me really well right when I got there. Uh, they made a huge trade. Um, as in, when I say huge, like there was like, I think six players involved in that trade, but some money, I guess, as well. And uh, it's funny, I just, this ru the rumors that uh, about is that with the money involved that the previous team power had bought a bus for me, but uh, a little laugh. And I think some of the players even still today still randomly hear that rumor. Um, I was told that it wasn't true, but uh, very funny. <laughs> Um, that is funny. Wow, that's and funny. yeah, bought, going bought, to, you bought a bus for them. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the the what thing was the the bus had um, broken down there, and not even a quarter in the year. I think they had to get a new one, so they spent the money maybe on it, that type of thing. But that was a rumor going for a long time. It was pretty funny. Um, and anyways, in merit, they just. Al Glendening and Gilles LeBaire were the, the coaches there, and they just, uh, right from the beginning, they, they must have known how big of a trade they made and how important it was for us to, to go for it. And there's many other great players, like I said, on the team. Um, and, um, yeah, we, we just, uh, right from main camp, just remember doing extremely well there as so I was expected to and and we just took it right into the season and uh, as a team we we did pretty well uh, won a lot of games and and uh, had a lot of fun um, I remember at one point Al Glendening was was not only our, our head coach but he was uh, he had to be our trainer because the trainer had quit uh, he drove the bus as well um, and I'm sure there's another one or two other uh, positions that he had but uh, it was pretty funny and hadn't seen our coach drive the bus before so <laughs> no. It was... no that doesn't usually happen in the junior ranks but uh uh you see that uh you know even sometimes these days it's a gm head coach and uh you know if they lose guys through the year they end up having to put that hat on too uh it makes it uh it makes it fun it makes it interesting oh, yeah. it makes it for some really great stories um uh speaking of that um Tell me some of the you know favorite stories you can remember in Merritt. Uh, you must have had so much fun with that. With success, there comes fun. Uh, you end up you know getting to have a really close knit group, a lot of laughs, a lot of good times. Uh, is there a funny story that you can tell us? <laughs> um, there was many, but I mean, I remember with the group that we had, like I had mentioned, was uh, Alan Mazur, Jared Tooten. We had Greg Dushinsky as well, who was from Victoria, a, a friend. Um, yeah, and then Campos and, and them, and we would, uh, we all hang out a lot. We do breakfast together at, uh, my billet place with Greg Jashinsky and, um, played a lot of poker that year. And just remember always going up to, uh, Kamloops, um, there for a bite to eat. And I remember we'd randomly make some trips into the casino, but also, um, going to, um, the Camus Blazers games, but we're just able to do more stuff together. And um, yeah, it's just, just a great time. I've heard you mention your billet family there. Uh, obviously billet families are super important for young junior players, leaving their, their own families, going into these small communities, typically uh, having to try to assimilate, play hockey and, and try to, you know, keep your studies up as well. Uh, Melody and Greg Johnson, uh, I guess, were your was your billet family there. Um, uh, mention them and how important they were to your uh, being able to keep it together, get to the rink all the time, uh, you know, all the things that you had on your plate. Yeah, no, Mel and Greg were awesome uh, during that time, and um, they were just so helpful and uh, supported what uh, myself and, and Greg Dushinsky wanted to do. Uh, they knew hockey is important. I believe that was our first, their first year of having billets. Uh, um, but yeah, they just provided everything that we wanted and, and needed. It was, they were amazing. Um, 
and uh, yeah, they were just fans. Uh, I think that Greg had been fan uh, watching a lot of games. I'm sure Mel as well. Um, but that year they supported us a lot just with watching also. And um, it's so important for a junior hockey player at the ages of, I'll say 16 is usually when the youngest ones start 17 and uh, yeah, there's their second parents and people that you need to rely on. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's some good and some not so good ones, but um, you know, all along the way, I think that's where you just learn uh, the life skills, right? Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're also lifelong friends that uh, still like to say hi to you once in a while. That's great. Yeah, really nice to hear. Okay, so all your success in Merritt ended up uh, uh, culminating in a four-year scholarship. Uh, Quinnipiac uh, is, is the university you went to. Uh, must have been uh, fantastic to know that you're um, going to be able to get an education and your parents must be excited, the whole family. Uh, you mentioned your, your siblings also getting scholarships. Uh, but uh, yeah, being able to go there for four years, uh, pursue an education as well as your hockey career uh, must have been incredibly satisfying and very re rewarding for you. Yeah. Um... It's always easy to look back, but uh, very fortunate to come out of merit with a full ride scholarship to Quinnipiac and extremely wanted. I uh, uh, went, just remember going to Quinnipiac and um, I guess you'd say first year. I remember someone telling me, is like, as we got into it, it's like, make, like, watch how many nice cars come out of uh, move in day and all that. And it's true. There was, there was so many nice uh, being in that area of Connecticut that there was extremely nice cars coming out of move in day. And um, from there, yeah, it was just an awesome experience. Uh, one that I, I remember forever. That was probably the best time of my life uh, so far, even, even more so than pro hockey, uh, which at the time before you have wouldn't have thought I, all I wanted to do was to play pro hockey and make the NHL, but, uh, college hockey was the best, um, tons and tons of experiences, uh, some good ones and some bad ones. And, um, mostly though, obviously with the, the friendships, so many people being in one school in one area that you have a network of, of people that, you know, but also, uh, friends that you can, have some good times with I was just gonna say yeah and then obviously the hockey came after that and uh halfway through first my my first year in 2006 they had built a new arena um that's they're currently still playing in that's uh it's a state-of-the-art facility it's it's unbelievable um and yeah right from there it's my first year I was been was in a lucky position playing on I think it was like the third line as well similar to junior b uh, did extremely well on that line and found a lot of success. Uh, got on to like the first power play, I think. Um, and yeah, ended up with 27 goals that year. I think that was like top five in the country. Um, I think it was like fifth or something like that and, and had 41 points. That was, I think it was like around 15th, 18th in the, in the country. So as a freshman, that's Usually not doesn't happen or unheard of, but uh, was very lucky in that situation to put myself, my name, anyways, on the on the map and um, and have that four years at Quinnipiac to to really be one of the stars and and to yeah show my hockey abilities. Talk about your education. Uh, what degree did you pursue? I got a business management degree. Um, yeah, just different mindset back then was uh you know it was just all hockey 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 and obviously the the parents were pushing that education was important but uh you know after finishing it and and very happy and glad i was able to get that um you know whether as i look back even if i had to leave school early like some players are doing these days to make sure to go back and finish it but i had completed the four years scholarship does it help you uh these days now yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, I would definitely more so say all the networking, all the, the people skills, um, some of the street smarts definitely help a lot more. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm still new to business and learning, but um, def definitely now that as, as it's growing, uh, dealing with more challenges, 
Um, yeah, but school highly recommend the NCAA route. You get more time to develop and to show your abilities rather than going the tier one uh, major junior way of you have to be good right away. And if not, it's a big, it's like, it's quite a business to, to get you get eat up in right away. But at the same time, I know a lot of those players get to go to school after as well, but it's just from my perspective is their dream ends a little earlier. Cause I think where college is you get longer hockey lifespan and, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of guys that don't make it also or don't get the opportunity, but they're, I think more so guys signing out of their third or fourth years onto NHL contracts and uh, getting the opportunity. So that's something that in, in hockey is, is a very tough decision for a, a 15, 16 year old uh, trying to decide, am I going to go to major junior uh, Western hockey league locally out here, Ontario hockey league and Quebec league, or am I going to try to go uh, junior, junior B uh, or go a different route so I can get a, a full ride scholarship eventually. Um, it must, must be a very hard decision always for families trying to make that uh, that choice yeah from looking back it's definitely there's so many things that go through a player's mind I can imagine what goes through the, the parents minds but obviously people that they talk to and trust uh, I know my parents had talked to a number of people but also Greg Batters uh, is a big name in Victoria I believe he played for the Cougars back in the day um, yeah he's just been around for a while um, but anyways like just, I think it's crazy that they have the WHL draft at the age of like some are 14, probably and some 15. Yeah. Um, it's a very early, uh, I remember how big I was. I was extremely small and, and not much muscle on me at all. Um, didn't, didn't get drafted, but you know, so some of these guys that are really good early, I saw a lot of players quit within that next, we'll say two to four years um, after that. And they were extremely good players. Um, much better than uh, the skills I, I had at that time. Um, yeah, and I don't know what it is. Life, you know, life comes in and uh, other choices, distractions, and some get burnt out, some are sick of it, um, and they stop. And I guess that's just to keep the long road just keeps you going uh, for those that continue on. Um, and, yeah, not saying that the WHO way or major junior – OHL way is, is wrong at all. I mean, there's some guys that are extremely talented and very good that that probably should take that route um, because they will get good opportunities to showcase their stuff. And and uh, yeah, it, it's it's much closer to the pro um, culture and atmosphere when you go that major junior way, where uh, junior A tier two and and uh, college route is different, but in ways can be. Um, a lot more cautious, I guess. Yeah. Um, and you get a longer hockey lifespan. Um, but yeah, and then now into my advising that I, I am doing with uh, some players, um, including the video coaching, um, goal setting, uh, shift analysis. Um, yeah, just, just depending where they are in their careers and physical development. Um, you know, it's just kind of one you pick one way or the other and you give those, um, I guess, the, the pros and cons of going yeah. each way. Yeah, of course. Yeah, lots. Um, before we go any further, I, I want to mention our, our partners and sponsors. Um, uh, we're sponsored by Verbero. Verbero is a hockey equipment and apparel company. Uh, they're an industry leader in technology, performance and value. And they have a really exciting product, the B350 stick. It's the lightest composite stick on the market. Uh, go to completesportsmedia.com. There's a link there that gives you an ability to go onto their website and get a discount uh, if you want to buy any uh, hockey equipment uh, or apparel. Uh, we also uh, have a great partner in Forever Living. This is an aloe vera company. They grow and manufacture aloe vera based products for health and beauty. Aloe vera has been celebrated for many years for all its cooling, soothing, and moisturizing properties. And uh, it's, it's really fantastic. Uh, we love the products here. And also Anchor.fm, Anchor they're a great partner for us uh, for this podcast. And uh, go to our website, completesportsmedia.com, lots of details for you there. Okay, so 
Quinnipiac, uh, you finish uh, your four years there, and then you get an opportunity in the East Coast Hockey League. Uh, you're you're um, not drafted. You're uh, able to go there, sign a contract. Uh, how did that? Uh, how did that end up coming about? Yeah, I finished um, my four years Quinnipiac. Um, my first year and my fourth year were my best seasons. Um, I believe I had 19 goals in in my last year. 40. I can't even remember how many points. Actually, 41 points. I think my last year. 44 the first year. I think I said opposite there, but um, we were we had a great last year. Uh, we were number four in the country at one point. We were 10 wins, one loss. I think. Um, and doing extremely well, exceeding expectations a lot. Um, but we had a group that, that had grown up. We had a big freshman class of like 11 players, I think, by the end of it. I think uh, we had anywhere from four to seven guys still at, at the school at the time, um, whether it was injuries or, or guys had to, they left um, to other schools. Um, and then, yeah, I remember that year I, I had signed an AHL contract with Grand Rapids and that was, uh, um, it was a, an awesome experience to play with many of the Detroit Red Wings prospects that had moved up the year after I was there. Um, guys like Brad May, uh, who was the mentor there, um, uh, Justin Ablocator, Thomas Tatar, Jakob Kindle, who was my roommate. Um, and another handful of excellent players uh, that went over to play uh, in the elite leagues from their countries. Um, yeah, and, and from there, it was just a great experience there, being there for a few weeks before returning back to school to um, graduate. And then the following year after that, I signed with the Hartford Wolfpack in the AHL, which was uh, the New York Rangers farm team. And, and a lot of guys there um, had played there for basically a couple of months with um, Wade Redden being a big name that was down from the NHL. Um, he was on a huge contract making six and a half million, but he was a great mentor to have around uh, uh, the dressing room and uh, Matt Zuccarello, Dale Weiss. Um, I remember a couple other guys, Devin Didametti, Justin Soriel. Um, trying to think, oh, Cam Dalbert was also there. Um, yeah, and lots of learning for sure in the first uh, couple years of pro and how things go. It's much different than college hockey, um, even based on the culture. I guess everyone uh, everyone is there for themselves in a way and, and wanting that next spot. And especially in the NHL, everyone wants that home that there's so few spots in the NHL to, to grab and you got to get others' attentions and, and play hard and – um, from there, uh, was played basically two and a half, three seasons with Greenville Road Warriors uh, in the East Coast and spent a lot of time there. Um, yeah, just trying to get better and improve and, and round out to the pro game and also perform to, to build the resume up. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, then you had an opportunity to go uh, over to Europe and, and play in Sweden and Denmark in that uh, first season. Uh, how great was it to, to play in Sweden? Yeah, it was it was a different experience. It was good. Um, again, met quite a bit of people and um, had some good teammates. It was definitely an uh, eye-opening life experience for sure. I was the only import there. So for the most part, the only guy speaking English. Um, they, they could speak English, but um, obviously not being their native language. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a big eye-opening experience. Uh, did really, really well um, early on. And uh, from there, I, we we had a really good team. They were trying to get promoted to the second league, which we failed to do. But from there, I, I had uh, made the switch up to the Danish league. Um, I think for the last six six weeks, I believe, um, of that year. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, and then a return back to the East Coast Hockey League for a little while. Um, jumped around to a few teams in there and uh, continued your pro career here back in North America. Uh, yeah, tell me about 
uh, some of those teams, some of the uh, things that you can remember about that experience? Yeah, when I, as I went back there, um, um, basically, uh, I was invited to the Ottawa Senators training camp um, after uh, head signing a two-way with their AHL Binghamton and their East AHL Evansville. Um, yeah, it was much uh, different experience after after coming back from Europe. Um, just played on many different teams after that. Um, I guess some people see that as a negative, um, which yeah, you don't want to be bouncing around teams, but it just allowed me to, to, I guess now what I'm doing today is network with, with not only all the teammates and, and more, uh, I, I guess opponents, but also, uh, was able to meet a lot of people, especially, I guess you'd say management to, to do what I am doing today. And, um, a lot of trades, a lot of moving, um, and then, uh, another, few years in Europe. Did it feel adventurous? Did you feel uh, nomadic? Uh, was it uh, was it hard, uh, you know, moving so many times, uh, so many different places? Uh, you know, how were you feeling as it was occurring? Yeah, it was, uh, I guess it was tough at times, but I did feel, yeah, I guess it felt adventurous. Um, definitely something uh, as I stopped playing here, I'll miss. Um, going from city to city, especially uh, recently being in Russia and, and playing in China, um, going from city to city every night, tons of travel. Uh, some days I remember we were traveling for like 18 hours, plane and bus, um, and just going from, we're from one place to the other place. Um, and uh, you really get a feel of how big Russia is as a country. Um, traveling from one end to the other end um, and yeah just a lot of time with the teammates and, and guys um, I didn't mind at all you we definitely found ourselves jet lagged and, and tired but I don't know I just think on that end I was able to keep a positive mindset of like this is awesome just kind of how oh, we'll never get to do this type of thing ever again where where travel is paid for and you're just going from place to place um, just like this I mean in the east AHL and East Coast, you're for the most part just staying in, in the U.S. and in Canada, you're basically staying in your pocket region where you're playing. Sometimes you make the um, trip out to West or or mid, I guess, into the mid, um, Midwest. But there is like we're going all over, and yeah, yeah, I don't think you'll you'll ever get to do that again unless you have it comes with your job, I guess. Uh, your parents are from China, uh, Chinese descent. Uh, were they born in China or were they born in Canada? No, they were born in Victoria. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My grandparents, uh, my dad's, my grandparents on my dad's side were born in China and uh, my mom's side, four, I'm fourth generation. So it was a number of years back. Yeah. Okay. Were, were your parents quite excited when they heard that you had uh, signed in China and you were going to be able to? <laughs> go back go back there and, and play yeah sure I, I guess um i think they're just always big on the opportunities life experiences ever since i was young um that and i'm sure uh my grandma was excited to hear that i was going to china i, I uh had not played in china uh, sorry never had been to china until i played there so that like i said um you know, a, a paid trip through hockey to China and, and to Russia is, you can ask for that. Uh, things get expensive, especially on the lodging end too, right? But um, did a lot of traveling through there and and saw some cool places. I would love to go back uh, at some point. Must have been a, a incredible, yeah, to, to get, uh, you know, paid to, to travel and get to play and, uh, you know, get to experience all, all, all these different cultures and different cities. Must have been amazing. Um, so you played uh, in the KHL for a couple of seasons. Are you done? Are you retired? Have you uh, decided uh, you're hanging up the jersey, the skates, and it's done? Or would you, you know, would you pursue opportunities if they arose again? Yeah, I'm not sure. Most likely I'll be done, finished playing. Um, just the, uh, yeah, the opportunities, not as many opportunities as I've gotten older and, and uh, with, the hockey company it's uh growing so well and 
Um, I also do enjoy doing that and, and interacting with the players and the young kids of, you know, trying to pass on what I've learned and seen to, to them to try to, I guess, fulfill their dreams and goals that they have, some different than others, whether it's junior hockey, college hockey, or, or playing in the NHL one day, whatever they choose. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a great feeling to interact with them. And definitely, uh, I think I get a taste of, of that end where you're, you get the hockey mentalities and personalities that you can still deal with. Uh, it's definitely nothing like when I was playing. Um, one being, um, you know, you just miss the team, the guys, and, and I guess trying to, there's always a mode of trying to win games with them. Um, but also too on the coaching end and now running a business is just way more time consuming <laughs> than playing. Uh, when you play, everything's there for you. You just, all you have to do is prepare, get ready and, and practice or play a game. Uh, I guess training is there as well. That's a lot of time, but, but on the coaching stuff, you're always having to do uh, extra work, you know, planning stuff out, whether it's practices or, or, um, I guess preparing for games or, or I guess on my end, I'm just having to do the amend of registrations of, of collecting the money and, and scheduling stuff. Uh, it's Brandon, Brandon Wong, hockey.com. Uh, people can find all the information about your training and coaching. Uh, I see that you, you say that you've um, been able to coach and train over 500 players. Uh, that must be incredibly rewarding. And, and all the experiences that you've just told us, uh, you know, definitely will lend to you having success and being able to mentor these uh, young people. Is it year round? Kids uh, will come to you uh, at all months and, and be with you all the time or uh, sporadically? How does it work? Yeah, for the most part, just trying to, um, I'm just setting that all up now, creating it. Uh, the big season is spring and, and summer season. Um, you know, some take a break, but some will go at it for the strong uh, for the the spring hockey to extend their seasons by another one or two months, which is about right. Uh, I know the minor hockey could be a little short at times, and and sometimes not as much ice time as some would like to have. Um, so the spring hockey have just provided uh, a unique style of training practices. Um, you know things that I've learned from top end coaches but also players have been able to be in the like I mentioned the Red Wings organization and and um, um, the uh, New York Rangers organization their AHL teams have had we've had to do the John Tortorella um, the training camp in Hartford uh, all the stuff that he wanted there and that was really tough and um, like I said mentors with Wade Redden and uh, Brad May there, learning lots off of them and just even how they played um, and all the young prospects on both teams, but then the NHL training camp of learning what it took and, and how guys uh, were and their mentalities around there. Um, yeah, lots of different experiences, including the college or just, you know, with the advising and, and, and uh, video coaching, which is during the season from, we'll say, August, September, all the way till February, March. Um, that happens so I guess you could call that long um, all year round sorry and um, yeah even while I was playing the past couple of years I was doing the video coaching so that was pretty neat to do um, but yeah just providing all this advice for for the players to kind of um, get that advantage and and apply it to their games to to get attention from coaches scouts management all that stuff you must have a lot of connections as well, uh, all through BC, all through the U.S. Now, so many players that you've played with, so many coaches. So uh, you must, your network must be incredible. Yeah, I've been really lucky and fortunate that way to have a good network. Um, I don't know, just with my personality and just who I was, I found that relationships are always really important to me. Um, probably at times I was all, I guess, known as just the nice guy. <laughs> Uh, but trying not to burn any bridges there. And um, yeah, I've been able to have friends from, from everywhere that I, you know, it's just about just respecting them. It's not that I was like really close with them, but respecting them and um, mutual connections and friends, that type of thing. And 
uh, on the hockey end, as I mentioned, Mike Keenan uh, in China for a couple months there. Um, that was a big eye-opening experience with him and how how he coached, but also interacting with him quite a bit. Um, and then also having, uh, being in those organizations, you know, Jim Nill, who's the Dallas Stars GM now, he was our GM in Grand Rapids, uh, talking with him, meeting, uh, we had Jim Schoenfeld and as our GM in Hartford, who was the assistant at the time in the Rangers. Um, and our owner in Greenville, um, um, he was also, he's also um, one of my references, um, Neil Smith. He's also won a cup with the 94 Rangers. He was the GM at that time. He was the Devils old assist, uh, head coach as well. So big hockey names there. And yeah, just all these, I think these junior and college coaches I played against or, or they're all around, I guess, my generation, some of them being a little bit older. And then also some coaches are from back when I used to play that are still around. So that's pretty cool. And um, yeah, just think with the credibility and, and uh, performance and experiences that I had back then that um, I think I'm able to, you know, have that respect of what it takes for players to play at those levels. You mentioned two names uh, that I had uh, some conflicts with. Uh, I was a reporter for, for many years covering the NHL and, and hockey in general. Uh, John Tortorella and Mike Keenan uh, were both guys here in Vancouver that uh, uh, came in, uh, had an abrasive style to them, uh, very tough. I hope you're not going to take some things from them and, and uh, become a coach like them because uh, they were uh, challenging at best. Uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I hope we don't see coaches like that continue uh, into the um, higher ranks, uh, you know, into the pro game. Uh, I think you, you can still be uh, a really good coach and not having to be a little bit uh, abusive and, and tough on guys. Uh, yeah, please don't become a coach like Tortorella or Keenan, please. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely interesting being with Mike Keenan. Um, all the things that, you know, I've heard and now that I experienced a little bit with the mind games part and, and that. And, you know, I really, one, the positive stuff I took from Mike was just his practice, how um, simple they were, but how hard they were and short. I find these days is a lot of coaches now are just doing, using the whole ice time an hour and a half and it just kind of going on and on and on where if you play like a game, um, you know, it, I know it's an hour and a half, but you're only on the ice for however many shifts, probably anywhere from 10 to 25 shifts, depends how much you play. Um, and during that time you're sprinting for, you know, some of the, some of those times. So we did a lot of that. He ran some pretty good uh, practices and stuff. And that's where I learned there. And Tortorella was more so I didn't get coached by him, but just his style of training for training camp. We had a, it was, we had to do a little running, uh, agility stuff, gym stuff, and also the skating tests that were, were probably the hardest. Oh, wow. Do you follow the NHL still? Have you been watching the current NHL playoffs? Uh, I follow it a little bit. Um, been busy with coaching, but um, I caught parts of the game last night and um, was watching the Canucks there a little bit as they were doing really well until, um, yeah, they started getting dominated by Vegas. And um, yeah, just in and out and following along what, what kind of goes on. And um, it's been exciting, definitely different, but it seems like you know, all the, now that they're, would say the middle, getting close to the end of this whole Stanley Cup playoffs that uh, now it's kind of setting in that, you know, it's the long distance run now. It's not just at the beginning where there's a bunch of games and they're all kind of fresh from having time off. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was fun uh, here in BC with that Canucks run. Uh, we hadn't seen that in a few years and nice to see some uh, excitement in the city, uh, people getting behind the Canucks. A lot of, um, you know, the people they call bandwagon jumpers, uh, people that I actually really enjoy when they are starting to follow the team and they, they say, you know, hey, I, I want to wear my jersey. I want to put flags on my car. Uh, you know, I want to become a fan now. Uh, it's, it was fun uh, around BC when the Canucks went on the run. Uh, it must have been fun in Victoria as well. 
Yeah, yeah, it's always uh, everyone's talking about when the Canucks are in the playoffs. They hadn't been in the playoffs for a few years back, but um, yeah, it's it's always good and always good to follow along. You know, we've got Tyson Berry. Um, he was with Toronto this year and previously with Colorado. He's from here, and then also um, the Ben brothers both in it. Jamie's still doing it with Dallas. Um, yeah, just all the talk and stuff. But um, Stanley Cup is the best best time of the year for hockey and and to follow along at the start of the playoffs the newly formed hockey diversity alliance sent matt dumba out onto the ice he had a really incredible speech that was very heartfelt and uh he took a knee during the anthem uh really shed a light on the issues that hockey's been going through the world's been going through with um problems with racism and things like that um how did you feel uh, seeing uh, this diversity alliance make make these speeches come and, and try to bring that into the NHL. Yeah, I understand. Um, you know what the players um, are doing and and you know coming together and trying to be a difference and have you know other players be educated and um, you know have people knowing that they support of of what's going on and what what they want to things to change and, and be a difference um yeah at the same time it's it's it is a lot i think on the tvs and in the media that um it's almost like it's taking away from the sport um i've had some a lot of discussions with different people um about all of that and it's just interesting and it's not just in hockey but football basketball and all that it seems like it's gone in but seems like hockey is one of the last sports for it to come into, but you know, it's tough on the fan perspective too, because you know, fans, you know, they probably want to be entertained and just watch the sports and, and watch these athletes and guys that get paid to, to perform and, and play because um, you know, for, for myself too, and I'm sure a lot of people I talk with, you know, it's, we kind of watch sports to kind of distract us and get us away from uh, our real lives and daily lives that we're, we're able to, you know, socialize with our friends or, or talk about what happened in that game. Um, and, and yeah, just kind of when they bring in the politics into the, the sport, it, it changes things a lot and can be a little too much and, and things that we've heard in our real lives a lot. So yeah, no, I, I definitely think, um, you know, it's these, these people that are looked up to, I guess you'd call them mentors as well that, you know, I guess have some of the power, especially on uh, being on TV uh, and in the media, they, they can show that, uh, you know, trying to help make a difference to the to world for, to the world for the better. <clears throat> what type of racism uh, did you face in, in your life on and off the, uh, are there any things any moments that you can remember? Any moments that uh, that you can talk about? Yeah, I think um, you know. Usually, even on the same teams, I think you kind of face uh, you know sometimes the inside jokes and guys just joke around, getting a laugh. Especially with the the high, the high strong personalities in the game of hockey, there's some characters that are very funny, and um, you know they're good guys and and all that. And I think there's a lot of inside jokes that you kind of deal with and. Um, also too, though, like playing, I guess on the ice too, ran into a few different situations of, of that stuff of, of guys saying some inappropriate, uh, language. Um, but yeah, it's out there and, um, I mean, you just try and ignore it. I think, you know, most players have to deal with that sort of adversity, um, whether it's racism or, or if you aren't very good at hockey, you're always getting chirped about different things. So so it's just a matter of, I guess, that's part of the, the life skills that people and athletes have to learn to deal with. And um, yeah, as you learn, I guess, how to deal with that, you just continue moving on with what you're, what you're trying to do and your mentality. Uh, do you think that um, because of your heritage, uh, your last name, uh, you would have um, got any less opportunities than you would have got if you were just named... Joe Smith or, or something like that? Uh, do you think? Uh, um, you know, it's a tough, that's a tough, very tough question. I think, I mean, even with my name, um, 
help could have really helped me, um, you know, standing out potentially um, with that type of name, but also on the ice, you know, and just kind of, it's just how you play. Um, we all, as I'm a coach now and, and work with different players, different uh, cultures, um, I guess you'd say even different people, whether they're extremely nice or, or, you know, maybe a little meat, some are a little meaner, some are, um, wilder or whatever and and uh you know everyone comes from different backgrounds and uh, the different culture thing is definitely pays a big difference because it is as i like to share with all the the parents is a lot of it's how you're raised and and what you do away from the rink is what you do on the ice um, and in your training um, all that leads to lead to that not one but just the you know how you all the habit stuff, whether it's the little things of chores of, um, you know, um, how to sleep, how you're able to live, the support that you're getting from your uh, immediate family, but also, I guess, your extended family, um, what you're, you're doing to learn all these things at home. And uh, it, it will apply to your, your uh, hockey journey and hockey life. Um, and yeah, and as as the the levels get up there and the competition gets higher, it just matters even that much more. Yeah, uh, one of the most famous Canadians, uh, a guy that ended up playing one game in the NHL, Don Cherry, uh, recently was fired for uh, what they said was offensive remarks, and it was uh, he pointed at the camera and said, "You people," and uh, was um, was fired. Um, He's been saying controversial things for, you know, the majority of his career. And uh, I don't think anybody was surprised that eventually that's how he, you know, he, his career on, on TV ended. But um, uh, did you find that it was offensive, um, uh, the things that he said? And, and you know, should, should he have been fired? Well, I don't, I don't know if I, my opinion matters too much. But I, I don't – I like Don Cherry a lot. Um, He's entertaining. I think that's probably one of the best things I get a little kick out of some things that he says. Um, but that's probably also why he has a career. He's got that personality. Um, people are meant to do things uh, in life and, and get put in those situations for a reason. They, they like them and it's, you know, a bit of that is business and, and money, but also just think he says it how it is. Um, you know, he does have that experience from the player playing with some top guys and then also from the coaching perspective in the NHL. So um, I think he's been doing it for so long that at that point when he actually got fired, he didn't actually change his way of speaking. <laughs> I, think it, I think it was just kind of the end of the road for them, probably for with CBC maybe, but uh, yeah, I'm, I didn't yeah, get hurt by it personally. I mean, he's been doing that stuff <laughs> that, uh, type of way and language for a long time um you know it's funny people just once the media is in there they able to dissect and people seem to not have anything better to do with their lives some of the, some of these days and just kind of you know comment on that stuff um at the same time obviously on the other end is you know it's it is important these days for for guys in his position to kind of uh, think about what they say and watch what they say. I think is is it is important, but um, yeah, he's no different than what he was. I think throughout his career. So um, yeah, I, I like listening to him, and and I, he does provide a lot of really good points during, and they're certainly entertaining. Yeah, very entertaining. Yeah, he uh, he always always, but very controversial. And you know, you make you make a lot of good points there. You talked about missing the camaraderie with the, your teammates and the guys that um, you would have played with over the years. Uh, talk about uh, you know some so, some funny stories, some you know really moments that you know just made you laugh. You tell at a dinner party if you sit down, uh, you know, want to entertain some people. Uh, there's got to be a couple of stories that you remember that just <laughs> Do make you chuckle still. Yeah, I'm not the big story guy. Definitely not telling them, but um, there's <laughs> there's many different ones. And I think I remember one that stood out was my first year pro having to, um, I guess, tell a joke and all that stuff. And 
Uh, I remember that was called our rookie party and we all had to get along uh, to get together and we dressed up as, as uh, girls to start off. And uh, we had our vets, I think one or two vets that, that were in charge of us. And uh, yeah, we dressed up as girls and we had to, I remember going to a restaurant bar, we had to tell a joke and we spent time there. And, and uh, I think those are some funny, good times that uh, I guess very unusual and things that you don't normally do. I think throughout the junior career, college career, there's, there's a lot of funny moments. I think just, just the boys getting together and doing uh, <laughs> funny things. And, and you always, you always will have one or two of those personalities and, and high character guys that are, are extremely funny. that get the boys going together. Um, but uh yeah, just even like the littlest things that that uh, aren't big things, just that are pretty funny that you kind of remember. But um, yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, are you uh, are you sticking in Victoria for life now? Um, is that uh, is that going to be home until you retire? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure fully what's going on, but I am here now and starting up the or sorry, building the company up and. Um, been a few years going and um, yeah Victoria will definitely be a home base uh, my fiance is in um, Wichita Kansas so so depending where and and also where we want to kind of end up and, and locate but uh, yeah for now I mean in the spring and summer it's really important that I am able to come back and, and do the coaching and during the hockey season maybe it's possible to to go somewhere else, whether it's down where she is or, or stay up here um, uh, on the advising video coaching end can, can do that remotely from the computer. So when's the wedding date? Have you set one? No, no set one yet. We're still trying to figure that out with the, with the COVID and all that, but um, probably in the near future. Has there been some separation because of COVID with you and her? Yeah. Yeah. It just hasn't been able to come up. Um, to the border yet uh, so it's been a delay but lots of different delays especially with the border being closed but also the, the two-week quarantines right yeah how have you managed through through covid and, and lately with uh, the, the smoke from the, all these fires uh how how has it been it seems like we're almost uh, at the apocalypse mark uh, you know you can't believe what you see out there every day when you go out everybody in masks and Everybody uh, worried about getting sick. It's uh, it's been, it's a crazy world. This 2020 has been a bizarre year. Yeah, it's definitely different. Um, for the most part, I think you know the the health officials are doing a great job of keeping people informed and also what's going on. Um, you know, it's for the in my world of who I interact with, it seems like people are are doing a pretty good job. You know, we can get as the it's been going on since we've been shut down about, I'd say three, four months ago, it's been getting a little more relaxed and looser, but um, you know, this is kind of the time that they all is wondering when kids are going back to school and in the flu season, but yeah, it's just crazy with the smoke in the air uh, right now, but uh, we've had this before. Not, I wouldn't say as bad, but um, yeah, it's uh, one thing after the other. It seems like these days, but just kind of keep going and, I saw on your website uh, that you've been doing some of these Zoom calls with uh, some of the guys that uh, you've encountered in your playing career. Uh, do you enjoy uh, these Zoom calls when you're the host or when you're the guest? Uh, what do you enjoy more? What do I enjoy more? Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. I think these days I definitely just helping build the build the business and, and help players out that I enjoy, I guess, being the host and letting the others talk about their experience and, you know, trying to bring on some, I guess you'd call it iconic people uh, and, and people that are looked up to um, by some of these young players, but some parents and coach, some coaches uh, with their successes in hockey, uh, been able to, you know, come across a lot of uh, very good people and very good the, and people that are very good at their jobs um, and passing on all that advice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind doing it on this end either and giving answers of what I've been through, but um, yeah, just hoping 
the players take the time to watch those things is that's kind of what, what I wish I had, uh, have the resources to watch those things, you know, whether it was two, five or 15 minutes long of a video, but, um, you know, very, uh, interesting, um, feedback or advice. Nice. Nice. Uh, some of the most iconic moments in, in hockey here in BC were the, the 2010 Olympics with Sidney Crosby scoring the golden goal. Uh, then the following year, the Canucks going to the final against Boston. Uh, where were you during the Olympics? Did you have an opportunity to come back to BC and experience any of it uh, live? Not the Olympics. I was still at school, uh, finishing my last year of college. Um, and then also the Canuck run, I was, I did come back that year. Uh, I probably went to two or three of the Stanley Cup playoff games. Um, I think I remember going to game five uh, of the Stanley Cup final against Boston. Uh, the Canucks had won one nothing. I can't remember. Um, I can't remember who was... Uh, who scored the goal? I feel like it was Rafi Torres, but it might have been one of those other uh, third, fourth line guys that had scored it. But uh, what an exciting time um, for Vancouver and BC to have that run, and hopefully they can do it again sometime soon. It seems like the competition just gets, gets harder, and I don't know, from from my eyes, is they had a great run this year, and, and exciting to see the the promise kind of going up, but just kind of going against a Vegas team like that is seems like they're so far behind in, at times too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You didn't know, uh, especially that first game, uh, they got beat five, nothing. You thought, Oh, uh, you know, this team's uh, very overmatched, but uh, they ended up pushing it to game seven and uh, yeah, it was a exciting run. Uh, always is. Uh, it's great when uh, the city and, and the province can uh, rally behind the, the team and uh, you know, get the, you know, get the juices flowing, get everybody interested in hockey again. Uh, where were you during Sidney Crosby's golden goal? And did you have any Canadians around you at that moment? That's a good question. I don't really remember during that time, but uh, I was obviously watching it somewhere. Um, that would have been in, in January or February. February, of, yeah, February. So I was probably still at school, actually. I believe we were still, we were watching probably as a team and some of the students at school. But um, yeah, that was exciting as well, obviously, with Canada. And, and even crazier that it was Sidney Crosby, you know, the the best player in the world and, and for Canada at that time to score the winner. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was big for Canada and, and something that a lot of people remember, I'm sure. This was a, a pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed my time with you today. It was really nice to uh, look into your life and, and, you know, talk to somebody that's been involved in hockey this much. Uh, I'm so excited for you and your next chapter. Uh, Brandon Wong Hockey is going to be super successful and it'll be so nice to be able to mentor kids, coach them, train them, give them the ability to have a life like you've had through the game of hockey. It's going to be incredibly satisfying, I'm sure. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Appreciate you having me on and, and talking hockey and some uh, advice and stories that uh, I've been able to live through. And yeah, hopefully uh, all the kids are you know ready to go for this season and good luck to them. And, and um, yeah, we'll be following along. Sounds great. Okay, well, yeah, thanks for joining me. I appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the next time we get an opportunity to talk. Okay, thanks, Darren. Okay, thank you. Take care of yourself. Okay, well, that was, uh, that was a fun hour of my life and really great to see uh, su such a, a fantastic guy in the world of hockey. Uh, really nice to be able to uh, see someone that had a dream as a young kid to, to play hockey, had a passion for it, had the ability, uh, ended up going through so many different uh, cities in, in BC finally getting an opportunity to take, uh, get an education and take his hockey career farther, uh, not even getting drafted and being able to become a professional player, going to eight different countries around the world, uh, being able to play 400 professional games. Uh, and it's an exciting story, fantastic to see, and, and really nice to have an opportunity to find out that rise. And, and uh, you know, I'm really happy and excited for Brandon being able to do this. 
uh, hockey camp, hockey schools, uh, being able to coach and train these young kids that have the same dreams as he did and being able to uh, help them pursue it with a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight, a lot of the things that uh, he was able to utilize in, in his life to take him where he wanted to go. So thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate when you tune in, watch, uh, like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your family, tune in every week. We're going to have great guests like Brandon Wong. Uh, thanks for all the great commentary we've been getting. It's been a lot of fun. It's only a couple months in and we're, uh, we're growing uh, rapidly. So uh, thanks again. Take care of yourself. Bye for now.